I'm John Porter. Uh, I'm the partner in charge of the Houston office of Baker Botts, and uh, I want to welcome all of you uh, and those on the webinar uh, to this program today. Um, we are proud to co-host this program with the Houston Bar Association, the Houston Volunteer Lawyers Program, and the Lone Star Legal Aid. Um, and I think it's fair to say that even if you haven't been affected, you know somebody who has significantly been affected by Hurricane Harvey. Um, and, uh, and, and the results of this, um, I mean, the, 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 the impact is going to be felt for years down the road. Um, the work that many of you have already done, Lone Star Legal Aid, Houston Volunteer Lawyers, um, have been, have been on the ground in the shelters, uh, since, since the shelters opened, essentially, um, has been significant. And the work that you all will be doing, uh, is going to be significant because there are so many people that have been impacted. I read this morning that uh, that there have been over 500,000 FEMA applications for individual assistance filed. That's more than double, substantially more than double, what was filed uh, in the Northeast after Hurricane Sandy. Um, and I will tell you, I'm I'm a runner, um, and and this is going to be a marathon. It's not a sprint. A lot of people have done a lot of work so far, but there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and in the next six to 18 months, a lot of the legal questions that folks are going to have are going to pop up as they're dealing with their insurance carriers, as they're dealing with FEMA, as they're dealing with other third parties. Um, and so the, the assistance you're going to get today, the knowledge you're going you're to learn is going to be invaluable. Um, and it's going to be invaluable to so many people uh, who are in need of that assistance uh, and can't afford to, to pay a lawyer for it. Um, it uh, last night, we, uh, we had the honor of hosting a legal lines in conjunction with some of our clients. Um, and uh, over three hours, we received 175 phone calls. And, and obviously, that's just the tip of the iceberg. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, there's a lot of work that has been done. And, and I want to thank you uh, for all of your efforts. And so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my friend, Houston Bar Association President Alistair Dawson, uh, who's going to say a few words. So, Alistair, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, thank you all for being here, and thanks to Baker Botts for hosting um, this tremendous event. Um, you know, as John said, the, the, the number of people impacted by Harvey is unprecedented. It's the largest disaster relief effort ever in the history of the United States. And to put it in perspective, there was 100,000 claims after Katrina. So it's five times the number of claims uh, that they saw in Hurricane Katrina. And these people uh, that have been affected, many of them lost their homes, lost their belongings, lost all their clothing, lost their you know, things in their house, lost everything in their apartment. Um, there were thousands that were displaced to shelters, um, and they're now being uh, relocated to temporary housing. Um, and for them, it's, it, this is indeed a crisis, a major crisis in their life. And, and they have lots of questions that they need answered. And we, the volunteers, the pro bono uh, lawyers, are helping them answer those questions. Um, and it is making a profound difference in their life. You can't imagine the calm um, that, you, you know, you can get when, when you've got answers, you've got all these questions, and then you, you get together with somebody and they help you answer those questions. I mean, it brings a lot of relief uh, to them. And I will submit to you that um, helping those in need uh, in Houston now will be one of the most profound things that you as a lawyer can do. Um, and, and so I applaud you for, for being here and for the work that you have given and will give in the future. Um, as John said, we've been in the shelters, um, along with uh, our friends from Lone Star. Um, you know, talk about an impressive group of people. The folks at Lone Star Legal Aid, let me shout out for them. They have a fire at their downtown office on Monday of the, of the storm, and on Tuesday they're at uh, the shelters working. I mean, that is impressive. Uh, and they have been uh, boots on the ground every day. Uh, in all the shelters, working uh, countless hours with the uh, pro bono volunteers, but they have done an amazing job. So shout out and thanks to Lone Star Legal Aid. You guys have been amazing. Um, so we've been with them in the shelters. The shelters are winding down. Um, that's the, what they're supposed to do. They move people into temporary housing, um, and they set up what's called disaster recovery centers, 
and um, they're typically in hotels or motels or, or apartment complexes. Uh, and we're going to be having some booths in some of the disaster recovery centers, and you'll be able to sign up for those on the uh, HBL portal, um, which is portal.makejusticehappen.org, I believe. Um, so as John said, you know, this is the immediate crisis, and this is very important. Um, but the, the bigger need and the bigger challenge is going to be 30 days from now, 60 days from now, when these claims are denied or the insurance company is not playing fair um, or what, you know, when they, when they need legal help, when they need pro bono legal assistance. So I encourage all of you to sign up on the portal to take a disaster case. There's a, there's a sign up where you can um, indicate you want to help with disaster relief. And then when these people come, and they're going to come in the thousands, uh, when they come, uh, we'll get you signed up where you can really help them and help uh, make a meaningful difference in their lives. So thank you all for being here. And I've, I watched the earlier presentation. You're in for a, a real great education on disaster relief and legal aid. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jesse Campbell. I'm the attorney engagement coordinator and a staff attorney with Houston Volunteer Lawyers. And so I wanted to kind of let you know what HVL is doing um, in our collaboration, because it is a massive collaboration with Lone Star and, of course, all of our pro bono attorneys um, in this response. Um, first, I wanted to kind of put some perspective in terms of how overwhelming it has been and humbling to see all of you coming out. As of yesterday, we had had over 400 unique volunteers at the shelters alone, and that doesn't include anyone who has signed up to work at clinics, do copies, drive around, and things along that lines. And so, um, as Mr. Rogers says, you look for the helpers, and it's very wonderful to see all the helpers here. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our portal, the best way to volunteer um, to take a pro bono case in these situations is just to come to HVLs, which is portal.makejusticehappen.org. We actually have a sign up there specifically for disaster-related um, cases. Um, but the other pitch that I'm going to hopefully make today is that we also want you to start considering this presentation is wonderful and you're going to see about how to help um, the disaster related cases, but we also want to encourage you to continue to look at our regular cases. So one of the things that HVL is currently doing is we're contacting all of our clients that were already on our waiting list to find out if they were affected by Harvey in any form, shape or fashion. But we have cases that are probate cases that are pending, name changes that are pending. Those cases will affect their assistance going down down the line. And so if, um, so if you're feeling the need to help somebody right now just because it's not necessarily a FEMA case, doesn't mean that it's not going to be affecting them going forward. So, um, but all that being said, we're scheduling clinics. Um, we'll let you know about that. Come on out. Um, and we're going forward from there. And that's pretty much it. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Ms. Roslyn. Good morning. I am Rosalind Jackson. I'm the directing attorney of the Houston Office of Lone Star Legal Aid. And on behalf of Lone Star, I want to extend our sincerest um, gratitude to the volunteers um, who have come out to the shelters and to the DRC to help us serve the Houston community. The Baker Botts staff, attorneys, volunteer attorneys, the HBA attorneys, Houston Volunteer Lawyers, they have been on the ground with us since day one as we provide services to the Houston community. We thank you for making copies of our disaster flyers. We thank you for translating our flyers. We thank you for helping us with management oversight. Today we have two speakers from um, Lone Star. The first speaker is Amanda Bosley who is the Equal Justice Works AmeriCorps Fellow. She has been with Lone Star for two years, um, and during that time she has represented clients on disaster cases in, throughout Harris County and also in Southeast Texas. Our second speaker will be Sandra Brown. Sandra has been with Lone Star for 23 years and she has been doing disaster work since 2001 with Tropical Storm Allison. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Amanda and Sandra. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mo Disasters, Mo Problems. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to ask everyone if they would please hold their questions until the end. Uh, it got a little confusing last uh, webinar, and uh, CLE 
part, part because we were taking questions during it and people on the webinar can't ask their questions during it. So we're trying to save it all at the end to become more organized. Also, um, we're going to email this to everyone and everybody who signed up. So if you're on the attendee list with your email, the PowerPoint will be emailed to you afterward. So we'll get started with a FEMA, FEMA overview. We're um, a little bit about what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about FEMA and some deadlines and application deadlines, appeal deadlines, and certain FEMA assistance, and also landlord tenant issues, flood insurance, uh, subsidized housing of public benefits, things like that. And Sandra will talk more about flood insurance afterward too. That's going to be very detailed. So FEMA is authorized by the Stafford Act, and FEMA doesn't hit the ground until there is a presidential federal declaration, and there was one pretty quickly after this flood. We're telling everybody to apply to FEMA that was affected by the flood, so everybody needs to apply. Uh, the ways to apply are by phone, online, or in person at a disaster recovery center. This is the link to people to search by their address. The deadline to apply is 60 days after the declaration. And we have October 25th here. Uh, I think that's 60 days plus one is what Sandra is telling me is the deadline for people to apply to FEMA. It's probably going to be extended because Harvey was so huge. Okay, so we'll talk about some types of FEMA assistance. The first is housing assistance. They also do other needs assistance. But for housing assistance, we have temporary housing repair and replacement and semi-permanent or permanent housing. The temporary housing that there is what they're providing to people first and foremost, like rental assistance. Um, and then they also have other needs assistance, which is medical and dental, transportation, personal property, things like that. This is the number one slide of FEMA advice to provide to clients. Always apply to FEMA within 60 days of the date of the disaster declaration, appeal any decision within 60 days, um, respond to FEMA within 10 days if they're asking for additional documents, use the money for what it's intended. We tell people to keep the receipts for seven years. I believe FEMA's guidelines say three years, but we had people having to prove what they spent their money on after Katrina up to seven years later and try to keep the receipts in maybe a sealed a box or something or keep copies of them if you can because if you go to Walmart a week later, your receipt is faded in your pocket. So we're telling people to really try to protect their receipts because FEMA does audit their files and they will ask for, for proof that the money was spent on what it was intended. So some reasons for denial for housing assistance, the most common ones we see are you have insurance to cover the loss. The damage to your home was not caused by the disaster. Your home did not sustain sufficient damages. They haven't defined what sufficient is, but FEMA only provides money to people to um, repair their home and make it safe to live in, not to restore it to where to what it was pre-disaster. Or if your property is a secondary or vacation home. Some people do have secondary homes, and if they use it as a rental property, they may could get a loan from the SBA for some business um, help. So another also common or ownership is not verified or the occupancy is not verified. Uh, other needs assistance reasons for denial, the most common one we see is transportation. A person has to at least have liability insurance on their car and have their car registered with the state of Texas. And they only will pay for your primary vehicle. If you have two cars in a household, you would have to prove that you're using the second car for like medical purposes or something like that to, in order to get any for two cars. This is just an example of a letter of denial that one of my clients got and uh, not for this flood. This is, I think, two disasters ago. And, and then this is a, an example of a denial you would see online. So I've already mentioned this, but the deadline to appeal FEMA decisions is 60 days from the date of, of the decision letter. That's an important, firm deadline. Late appeals will only be accepted with good cause shown. And FEMA has 90 days to render their decision. And if they don't give someone a decision, it's denied as a matter of law after the 90 days. And a person needs to write in their appeal um, that I declare under penalty of perjury that this information provided is true because I've had people denied and they call FEMA and they say it's because you didn't say that the information was true. 
So that can be a serious statement to put into an appeal. And always ask for a copy of the file, too. So this is how FEMA and Texas Health and Human Services Commission work together. FEMA provides housing assistance. Texas handles the other needs assistance um, for FEMA. All appeals still go through FEMA, so if someone's denied transportation or personal property assistance, then apply to FEMA, but when you're following up and figuring out um, why you were denied or you have a question about it, call the Health and Human Services Commission, because if you call FEMA, they're going to say call Texas Health and Human Ser Services Commission, and the phone number is here is 1-800-582-5233, and if you're denied multiple times for other needs assistance, you will probably get a hearing. Normally, if my clients have been denied three times, then the hearing agent, the person who's working on my file will request one with the hearings officer. All right, so let's talk about the Small Business Administration. Uh, the Small Business Administration provides um, loans to businesses and individual homeowners, also renters for um, their personal property. Business, these are the types of the SBA loans, business physical disaster loans, loans to businesses of any size, also private nonprofit organizations such as charities can apply, economic injury disaster loans, these are intended to assist through the disaster recovery period. Um, the most common ones we're going to see are home disaster loans. These are loans to homeowners or renters. Like I said, um, renters can even apply to get personal property. The interest rates for SBA for Harvey are um, the no credit available elsewhere is if someone can't go to the bank and get a loan today, and then credit available elsewhere is if a person could get a loan at a bank. And as Sandra says, this is the one time where having worse credit will get you a lower interest on a loan. So. These are the loan amount limits, business loans are up to $2 million right now, and home loans $200,000 for the repair and replacement of real estate, and $40,000 to repair or replace your personal property. Some people aren't being referred to the SBA right now. Um, they don't always refer low-income individuals because they know they will be denied, but I've actually had clients come to me and say that they were denied for their transportation, and FEMA said they had to have applied to the SBA first. So we tell everybody to just apply to the SBA, even though it scares them. You know, low-income people say, I don't want a loan. I don't want to have to apply for a loan. I know I'm going to be denied, but they need to be denied in order to get some help. That's on the next slide. This slide, they don't have to apply for the SBA in order to get these, this kind of help. But for if they want personal property, transportation, moving, and storage, they're going to have to apply to the SBA. So our biggest um, denial reason we see for FEMA is proof of ownership. It'll say denied, um, ownership not verified. So this is how FEMA deni this, uh, defines a owner-occupied residence. The legal owner um, does not hold formal title but is responsible for payment of taxes or maintenance or has lifetime occupancy rights. So even at the disaster centers, sometimes FEMA will start calling tax offices if they can't find the person's information in the public record to show that they own the home. And if they can't prove it that way, they'll um, allow people to use alternate documentation. I have that on the next slide. But these are the documents that they will accept, obviously, if you have a deed or mortgage documentation or insurance documents to prove that you are the owner of the home. They're going to accept that. But um, they will take alternate verification documents like property tax, real estate provision, uh, contract for deed, and they will accept quick claim deeds, actually. But they ha all, the documents have to be dated before, be effective during the disaster period. I've had FEMA tell people that they can go write a quick claim deed right now and come back and they'll approve them, but they deny them because it's dated after the disaster. Um, another common one is a lot of people in Texas live in their parents' home and their parents are, have died and they didn't have a will and they didn't deed the property to them. So now they're just living there. So now FEMA comes along and they want you to prove that you own the home, but it, technically your parents do, but they're dead now. So we've quoted this in our FEMA appeals, this Texas Estates Code, Section 201-001. 
And if you just quote it and put the um, facts, even if a person has more than one sibling, they don't have to prove that through affidavits or anything. They're not trying to clear title. All you have to do is say this one person was living in the home. And it helps if they have um, like a receipt for fixing the roof or a hot water heater or something like that, then that would help them to be able to prove that they're keeping maintenance on the house or paying the taxes would be good too. I actually have a lot of clients who own, who live in mobile homes, and you need to check the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs website to see if they're the actual owner. Nine times out of ten, they're not the owner, so or ten times out of ten, usually in the case of my clients. But um, if they're not listed as the owner, if you can contact the owner somehow and get an affidavit from that person that says, I sold it to this person who is my client, then FEMA will accept that. And Sandra's going to talk about flood insurance, and I'm just going to kind of go through the slides as she's speaking about it. Um, so a couple points on what Amanda said. There's an equivalent of safe test provision for if there's a well. So there might have been a well that they did in probate because there's a lot of common communication that people don't think they have to probate the well. Um, so that it's in test to see or with the well. It passes to you immediately. And also, these people are still going to fit under the second category from the CFR under FEMA's own rules. So we're usually very successful with the ownership issues. Um, so anyway, going on to flood insurance. Um, so as Amanda said in the slide, it's complicated. Um, this is a lot of times, this is the first time for a lot of people. There's a lot of first time flooded homes. So there's uh, flood insurance functions um, in a lot of different ways from your homeowner's policy. So it's important that everyone understands the difference and are able to navigate. Um, sorry, do you have your mic on? Oh, I think I hear that on the I'm sorry. I apologize. No, I didn't. Okay, so with regard to the flood insurance, as Amanda says, it's complicated. This is the first time a lot of houses have flooded and a lot of people are going to be navigating this system for the first time. And since only 20% of the houses in the greater Houston area have flood insurance, you'll see the, the problem. And not a lot of people have them and not a lot of people have accessed them before. So it's important that we understand the differences between the flood insurance. Um, we made this PowerPoint as a very comprehensive PowerPoint. So I'm going to hit these highlights and I have a secondary PowerPoint just talks about flood insurance. So you should file with FEMA. You keep your options open. The reason is your flood insurance doesn't have displacement coverage, but FEMA will be able to give you as the homeowner one month's rent to get you out of the immediate flooded house to give you time to regroup and figure out what you're doing. But first, you're going to have to file with your homeowners and be denied. So then you give that to FEMA. So you're going to see a lot of initial denials for FEMA that say, you've got insurance. And they go, but it's my, flood it's my homeowners I flooded. The reason they're saying that is they need your denial from your homeowners to know that your displacement coverage under your homeowners didn't kick in. And yes, we all know it doesn't kick in because it's a flood event. But FEMA needs to document their file to release that one-month housing to the homeowners. So what you need to know is tell everybody um, apply to FEMA within the 60 days, apply to the SBA within the 60 days because this is going to keep your options open. And we'll explain more how. Um, so they could give an advance either under FEMA or the SBA if you're not going to be able to settle your flood claim quickly. And it actually says in excess of 30 days in the unified guidance for the FEMA individual and households program. So if you're going to have a delay getting your flood insurance, you can go back to the SBA. You've already been approved. They leave your approval online. You don't have to take the money ever at all, but they have a window. The last, And they can change this. But the last time they were allowing the approvals to stay open for six months. So they'll release internal documents that might change that. But so you tell people, just get in the SBA window. Just get in, get approved, and then see what your need is. You don't have to take it. But if you don't get your clients to get in there within the 60 days, they're not going to be able to access the SBA. If you apply to FEMA and you're not very low income, they refer you on to the SBA. You can also apply to the SBA directly, um, but it's very important you get in within the 60 days for the disaster loans themselves. And a comment we had made is 
the SBA maybe needs to rename itself because the Small Business Administration disaster loans are the largest economic vehicle for disaster recovery in the United States. So their name's a bit of a misnomer now. So anyway, with the flood insurance, you've got to get your proof of loss in. It's normally 60 days, but they've already issued the blanket notice that it's one year from your date of damage. It's not one year from the disaster declaration. It's one year from your date of damage. So that is potentially the 23rd or the 24th of last month, depending when your house might have flooded. And in Beaumont, it's going to be a different date, right? Because that event happened a few days later. But just remember, you have to get your proof of loss in within one year. So they've issued a waiver on the advances. If they can see where you are and you send them photographs or you have a contractor, you can get an advance even before your flood adjuster comes out. They have liberal policies, policies on the advances, so it's up to 20000 without even the adjuster coming now and potentially more. Um, they want to get money in people's hands so they can start what's called the muck and gut process to drying out the house to make sure you don't turn it into a mold Petri dish. Um, so that needs to be done immediately. That's the logic behind their doing that. Um, so it's so as we said um, right now, if you were damaged on um, the 24th, you've got 365 days from the initial damage. I just wanted to comment though that on the webinar they're going to see October 24th, 2018 and that's a typo and we've changed it. So the people in the room are seeing August 24th, 2018. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so what you have is a lot of people running around that don't think they have a national flood insurance policy. They think they have a flood insurance policy from all state or state farm. They don't probably. It's a write-your-own policy, and it's important that you remember that name because if you want to know about updates or future extensions of the deadline, what I do is go to the, write your, the National Flood Insurance Program, the Write-Your-Own Bulletin, and those bulletins are where they gave us the information that we put in there, like, hi, you've now got a year instead of the normal 60 days to get your proof of loss on file, or hi, they're giving up to $20,000 advances without even having the adjuster come to your house. That's fairly unprecedented. That's, it, this is due to the large uh, size of the disaster. Um, so this is where you'd submit it. If it's insurance, if it's, if you're through a private insurance company, you will submit to your insurance company. If you're being serviced by FEMA, uh, the, the repetitive loss houses that you've now been hearing about, their policies are being carried directly by FEMA. So you'd submit it to FEMA, and those are the addresses. Okay, uh, the advance payments we've already talked about. Um, some more information. You can read that at your leisure. Okay, photos. This is true uh, if you're following with FEMA or if you're following with FEMA flood insurance. Remember, these are two sides of the same agency. So FEMA is your national flood insurance policy, and you'll be dealing with the, the flood director. And there's FEMA, which gives the up to 33300 for people that do not have recourse to flood insurance. So the same advice applies. Photos, document everything. We tell you, start just start taking it as it is, move from room to room, take video, take photos. As you take things out of your property, you need to take photos of them in place and then get them out and take photos where you've left them. Um, and take photos of everything. You can never take too many photos. Um, we're hearing that the adjusters are telling people you can take photos and throw it away. Make sure you always, if it has a serial number, get a serial number. If they tell you that, we, of course, as lawyers tell them, get that in writing. Tell them to send you an email or send them a confirmation email because this is in contradiction to their published advice for what you do while you're waiting for the adjuster. But we all acknowledge it's a huge flood event. We've got to get this stuff out. So document, document, document. Um, they're going to give you an, like an Xactimate spreadsheet to do the flood claim. It's essentially an Excel spreadsheet where you put everything. Remember, this isn't replacement value for flood insurance. This is actual cash value, so they're going to depreciate it. Um, artwork is at functional value. Antiques is at functional value, for example. Um, so you're going to do all that. If you do not agree... So now we get really quickly to the problem of what if you don't agree. You're going to hire your own adjuster. I used to tell people last flooding events, 
Obviously, this isn't even possible now. My best advice last year or the year before was, eh, if you know your contractor that's going to do this work with you, get him there when the FEMA flood insurance adjuster comes. Let him walk it with you because it's always much easier and more efficient to get your contractor to point out to him what he's missing as he goes from room to room. The flood insurance adjusters are certified through uh, the, the National Flood Insurance Program through FEMA. They use two programs. It's room by room. It's not, you know, um, I need 500 pieces of drywall. It's each room, living room, this drywall, living room, this many boards, feet of flooring. So it's a different program. It's not just what your contractor would give you a bid. That's why it's great to have somebody very familiar with the process. The people most familiar with the process are the public adjusters. Um, it's, that's prohibitively expensive for legal aid clients. A modest house would cost probably $5,000 to have a public adjuster. So that's a significant barrier to our people. Um, most of our clients, of course, at Legal Aid are relying on FEMA loan. Remember, 80% of the city is now relying on FEMA loan. They don't have access to this. Um, okay. um, Landlord-tenant issues. We're seeing a lot of these now and would like to ask that if you see defective notice issues, uh, you could contact Lone Star, refer people to the 1-800-504-7030 number. That's the State Bar of Texas Disaster Legal Hotline. And that is currently being answered by Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid, which is our counterpart um, over in the valley up to Austin and down due to um, issues with the phones after our little disaster of our own with the fire and explosion. So they can call and get advice. But we're also looking to take action quickly on landlord-tenant issues, specifically on defective notice issues. We've been hearing and anecdotally and have some people that haven't signed up with us yet that we've seen out at the DRCs and the shelters. They're being given bad notice. Um, so it's very important that they be helped as quickly as possible. So please contact us, and um, we'll be happy to give our contact information also. Um, so the landlord-tenant issues, if the property is completely unusable, of course you're entitled to a release of the lease. If a tenant has problems with that, um, get to a lawyer. You know, you can pick up the phone, and as I said, it's like, hi, I'm so-and-so's lawyer is magic, where they won't release a client from a lease. I know we get to be heroes now. Um, and you call and say, hi, um, here's the code. Let me read it to you. Maybe you're not aware of it. And my client's asking to be released. So, And they get released. That's great. If they don't, would be interested in taking action on those cases to release them from the lease. Um, if it's only partially damaged, you could get a reduction in your rent, as someone pointed out to me, not under the TAA lease. And as I, in the last seminar, pointed it back out to them, having done landlord-tenant for Lone Star Legal Aid for a number of years, I can tell you there's a lot of landlords in the city using the TAA lease. If you're not a TAA member, you cannot use that lease. So I could break that lease. And they were saying, what else would you do? I said, you could argue overreaching, and then they'll argue back that, well, they could have rented somewhere else. But how sympathetic is this right now at this moment to go in front of a judge with? I'm just saying the overreaching issue might be easier to reach this month than it was six months ago. Just saying. Um, so that's what they should do, either get released completely or get their rent reduced. It's urgent that they know they have to do that. Otherwise, they're going to be evicted for non-payment of rent. Also, as a pra I, tell, I tell everybody, as a legal aid attorney, there's legal matters and practical matters. So let's say I'm getting evicted for non-payment of rent due to the fact that I lost my job because I didn't show up the day after the disaster. This person can get disaster unemployment now, correct? So we make sure we tell them that. The statistic is the client that presents to legal aid doesn't have one problem that he thinks he has when he comes to us. He has seven problems. We need you to help us be holistic and make sure these people know other benefits that they can access in this time of crisis. Um, so if it's uh, the lease is terminated and they're released, they can get a pro rata refund if they've paid the whole month's rent um, already in advance. They'll get a pro rata rent. Uh, the security deposit, there's a lot of landlords telling people, we already know this, that I'm sorry, the apartment's damaged. And the answer is, but yes, it wasn't damaged by me, my guest, or my family, and wear and tear. This doesn't include the natural disaster. So once again, lawyers are very helpful to pick up the phone and say, hi, I'm a lawyer. 
so you guys didn't know you were heroes now. Um, so subsidized housing, um, for every problem under the sun, there's like an old English saying, there, there is a solution or there is none. So for subsidized housing, these people should not lose their subsidized housing. If they're in a project-based Section 8, for example, and they're on the first floor, it flooded. If there's vacant apartments on the third floor, they get to go up to the third floor. Under the property code, it says that you cannot extend their lease. So if I still have six months of my lease, my new lease is going to get me six months. Some landlords have been handing people a one-year extension. Well, if you want to stay in that same apartment, it might be a good idea to take that one-year lease because if you like that rent, we think rents are going to go up. So you advise on an individual basis. I'm just telling you what I see in some issues. Um, so all these people will be fine. If they're housing choice voucher, then the City of Houston Housing Authority should give them what's called a move package. If they don't have any more room at the end at their project-based Section 8, there might be another project-based Section 8 that has moved. We're going to get them there. They, this should be happening automatically. If not, send them to the 1-800-504-7030 number. We can talk them through. No one should lose their subsidized housing. And housing is going to become a bigger and bigger issue, especially affordable housing. And that's that slide. Um, no self-help eviction. People get a notice to vacate. If they want to stay, it's probably a defective notice. I, I'm sorry, I've done landlord-tenant for a long time. There's a lot of defective notices. So that could be something. But we have to see, does the client want to stay? Do they want to leave? If they want to leave, then you negotiate that and negotiate their refund and make sure they know to get their um, forwarding address, certified mail to the landlord so they get that. It's all a matter of the one-on-one, -on -one, what does your... What does your client want? But there is no self-help eviction. Um, okay, we talked about the security, and we weighed the option, and we talked about that. Okay, we can keep moving. Um, contractor fraud, Amanda. Do you yes, sure. Um, we always tell people to get an estimate before you sign a contract. We have people who come in the, to our office afterward. I had a client who signed on an iPad and it had no amount, but then they just superimposed her signature onto a contract, but you have to prove that later. Um, she thought she would just be charged $5,000 or something, and it just for tearing out sheetrock and some carpeting, they'd charged over $20,000. Um, so do not sign on an iPad, <laughs> and do not sign over your FEMA in or insurance proceeds directly to the contractor. A lot of contractors will try to swoop in and say, uh, don't worry about the cost, your insurance is going to pay for it, or you know, make me your your power of attorney so your insurance will pay me directly. And we ask people, do not do that. So normally we, we see these problems after the disaster, but now that we're out this time at the shelters and stuff, if we need to be telling people this because a lot of people do not understand that um, they don't need to sign on an iPad or they don't need to sign all their uh, insurance proceeds over directly to the contractor. And one point I want to add here is they're telling people you're giving me permission to contact FEMA or the insurance, and people just don't want to be bothered and they want to sign that over. But what they're actually signing is an assignment of their benefits. And also tell them nobody needs to know what you're getting from FEMA or the insurance company. And the sad fact is very, very few people get the FEMA max grant. As low as you think that grant is, believe me, not everybody's going to get that 33300 even if you thought they should have. Um, so it's very important that you tell them if they didn't need this information before the storm, they don't need it now. And for God's sake, don't tell anybody what you're getting from FEMA or the insurance company. So a little bit about public benefits. There's two different types of SNAP. There's emergency SNAP and disaster SNAP. Emergency SNAP, normally a person has to uh, sign an affidavit and turn it in within 10 days to the Texas Health and Human Services Commission to prove that they actually lost food so they can get that amount of money replaced. But this time, they've waived that 10 days. Uh, people have until September 30th to report that. And also on September 1st, Texas Health and Human Services automatically gave people a replacement for August 2017 benefits and gave them their, 17, their September 2017 benefits. There was a mass replacement of that, which was great. Um, a little bit about disaster SNAP. It, it hasn't become available that I'm aware of unless it's become available while I've been here today. But um, disaster SNAP is for people who 
weren't on SNAP before the disaster, but now they've lost their job or lost some income, and they can, they can also apply to SNAP now just for um, disaster-type SNAP benefits. This is the advice you would give someone, uh, exactly what I just said. You may qualify if you di didn't get regular SNAP before and um, you're living in the disaster area and you lost some income because of the disaster. And the, the applications are usually accepted for a period of seven days. And if you qualify, you're issued funds to help meet your food needs for 30 days. So we're waiting for Disaster Snap to hopefully be granted for Texas. Disaster unemployment assistance. A lot of people have lost their jobs because they couldn't get to their jobs or their the place of business was destroyed and now they don't have a job. So they can apply for regular unemployment benefits first, and then if they don't qualify for that, that's when they'll be referred for unemployment benefits. For, I'm sorry, disaster unemployment benefits. And these are the qualifying factors to be able to get disaster unemployment. And how you would reply is just go to Texas Workforce Workforce Commission, just like you lost a job any other time, and apply for the regular benefits. And then, if you're potentially eligible for regular, they'll pay those. And if you're not, they'll they'll refer you for disaster unemployment. So, for lost documents, DPS has been out at the shelters helping people try to replace their driver's licenses, social security cards. I, and I'm not aware that there is an emergency procedure right now. There should be one. Um, but you have to nor do your normal thing for an application for Social Security card if you're trying to replace it any other time. Birth certificates, marriage certificates, go to your local courthouse. And we have to have the link for people who live in Texas on here. Debit cards, credit cards. We have the major one, major phone numbers here for American Express, Discover, MasterCard, Visa. And here are some helpful phone numbers for food stamps. Department of Insurance, Workforce Commission for Unemployment, FEMA, Customer Support, and Texas Health and Human Services. Um, and these are our, our phone numbers, or our email addresses uh, for Sandra and I. Okay, and to wrap up, the most important thing we can tell you is get everyone to apply to FEMA within the 60-day window. We anticipate it's gonna be ex extended, but for right now it's 60 days, so it's urgent that they do that. And they, it's also urgent that you apply to the SBA within the 60-day window. You don't have to take it, but you've got to apply at that point. And if you need changes, you can come back and get a different evaluation. Um, it's also important that you understand the first step for the housing for the people that have been displaced is they send them to the EVAC hotel portal. We know that the hotels that have signed up for that program are completely full. So they're going to move on to the next Step for giving people housing help. They're going to put one month's rent, um, and it's fair market. It's not one month of your rent. It's one month's rent for the homeowners of the fair market value in the city and two months for renters right now. That money's coming into their hand. They need to get somewhere in rent. They need to not pay that to their current flooded landlord or they're not going to get any more help. If they want to move out, this is their one chance to do it with the help and assistance of FEMA. These FEMA benefits can continue for up to 18 months. There's, uh, I've got a lot of history with the program, so there's a flow and a transition. But they're gonna ask you to request that you have further continuing need. If you stayed for two months with your brother and don't have a lease and didn't pay rent, you're not gonna get continued rental assistance. If you rented a room for your bro from your brother, and he actually gave you a lease and you actually paid him and have rent receipts for that, FEMA understands because nobody needs to live with their family long term. As I mean, just honestly. I mean, I know they're going to step up, but that's the point of the program. You might have gone there on an emergency basis because you can't afford $100 a night at the La Quinta, but you need this help to make the long-term plan. That's what this is. So they have to understand they're going to need that lease and those rent receipts to get the continuing rental need. Do not pay your current landlord. We know a lot of landlords last storm were saying, sign up for FEMA, get that rent, pay me my rent. And people were paying rent at their damaged apartment, their old rent rate. That's not right. The practical problem is we know there's not going to be a lot of, of housing rental market, especially affordable. 
So that's the legal versus the practical. But the right advice is get a lease, move out, pay your two months rent. Whatever FEMA gives you money for, use it for what it's for. It's going to be some really bad repercussions down the road if you don't. They give you money for home repair and you lived off it instead. If you come through for the community development block grant money in a year, the first thing they say is pay in your FEMA benefits, your SBA loan, your flood insurance. If you can't do that, you're closed out and there's nothing we can do. I had a client after Ike whose son said, I need a new truck, Dad, give me your FEMA money for the home repair. And the dad did. And then the CDBG program came online and he said, son, I need that money, and the son will not answer his calls. I can't do anything about that. So it's important that they understand there are other programs coming online. The assistance will not continue unless you do with the assistance what they told you to do with the assistance. So that's my big thing. Apply to the FEMA. Apply to the SBA. Use your money for what they tell you to use it for. Keep receipts for absolutely everything. Make copies of your receipts so you can see them in six months. Document, 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 photos of everything. Short answer. Okay, now we're going to move on to questions from the oh, you want to do? Yeah. questions at the end. And thank you very much. I have a quick question, a point of clarification. So it's 60 days for a FEMA disaster assistance application right now, but it's one year, 365 days, if you're making an NFIP flood insurance claim. Right. Right now. It's 60 days. Nor the normal is the, the feds like 60 days. Let's just go with that. You've got 60 days from the disaster declaration to get in your FEMA application going toward that 33,300. You've got 60 days to put in your SBA application should you want to take out some of that low interest loan money for disaster recovery, whether your business or uh, for your personal home. For the national flood insurance policy, of course, you have to notify your carrier immediately, and it's normally 60 days from your disaster event, not the federally declared disaster, your personal disaster date, which will be a different animal. Normally, you have 60 days to get your national flood insurance program proof of loss on file. It has now been extended one year from your disaster date. So just for an example, people that flooded in Houston are going to have a different date from the people that have flooded in Beaumont. Okay. Any more questions? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm a little overwhelmed. I'm just going to start here and work my way down the road. I was wondering, the man who gave 18000 to his son, what was they asked him to give 18000 back? They gave him nothing further. What was the penalty or repercussion? The penalty is you do not get a community development block grant new house built for you. Do they need to pay that 18000 back? He would have to pay... Let's pretend what it was. I don't remember off the top of my head, but it was my client. Let's pretend it's 20000 that he got from FEMA. That was 20000 for home repair. They might have given him 33000 but it might have been 20000 home repair, thirteen for personal property. Okay. Then when CDBG comes online, he needs to take the 20000 he had for home repair and either show him by proof of receipts, keep receipts, keep receipts, that he did repair his home there. Even if they were going to tear it down and build him a new home, as long as he used his money for what FEMA wanted it for, they told him this is home repair money, then they will say approved, 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 and then they will put him in the, po the pool to get a new home built for him. These are modest homes. Uh, this person I'm thinking of was in Chambers County, and I think it was costing them um, 75000 to build modest homes, and they base the size of the home by who's in your house. So he was one person, so they would have given him, I believe it was a two-bedroom modest home. But if they, you, the first step when you get to the CDBG, so just an example, I live in Meyerland. The people in Meyerland were not interested in the CDBG program coming online because these would be very modest houses that would be actually smaller than the minimum required home in a neighborhood like Meyerland. But if you live in Anahuac and Ike came through, you're very happy for this CDBG program. There is not enough money to go around. To give you an example, last year the city of Houston picked only three neighborhoods in the entire city to give CDBG homes to. There are many, many people who were not made whole in other parts of the city. It's triaging. And the CDBG program will come through HUD, and it is a low and moderate income program. 
Okay. So let me, and remind me to keep repeating your questions. And your question is? Um, you talked a little bit about home damage, but for folks whose cars were flooded out, can you give like a couple of quick tips about how we could help people respond to insurance and those kind of things? Um, insurance, um, I think people are often surprised by what the insurance company is offering you, what you still owe on your note. So the question was the, the people that have insurance in cars. So first thing is, even if your property wasn't flooded, apply to FEMA if you didn't have the, the, the comprehensive coverage on the car. If you had comprehensive, then you file with that. It, that's a negotiating issue. It's a typical insurance issue that the private bar sees. So it's a negotiating issue with regard to that because what they think the value of the car is might be less than what is actually owed on the car, and then that is what we call upside down. Our clients see that a lot because our clients at Legal Aid often have very high interest rates because they have poor credit. But apply to FEMA, even if you have full coverage, because FEMA won't say that they're paying that gap, like how much you owe and then how much um, you're paying, however that's, you know what I mean? But so the gap, they won't pay that, but they'll pay it. Um, I had somebody who uh, their insurance paid them, say, $2,000, but they owed um, 8000 on the ha- on the car, and FEMA paid the $9,000 to them for a completely damaged vehicle later. So apply to FEMA. Back to my main point, please apply to FEMA. Next question. May I'm I have two questions? Okay, first question, and I'll repeat it. Okay. Keep reminding um, me. So just for clarification, if your home is damaged and you do not have home insurance. Home is damaged, it, no flood insurance, and correct? Will FEMA just give you money? Okay. You, you, must, you don't have to pay back? FEMA is a grant. The home repair money is a grant. They will not refer you to the SBA for that. If you do not have flood insurance, so you, the 80% of the cities relying on FEMA is their only recourse now. You will apply to FEMA. The good news is that is not income based. That is a grant. You will not have to pay that back. But if you want the things that were on the list as ONA, things like the personal property, the transportation, they're going to refer you to the SBA. If you refuse to do that, they're not helping with the other. And the sad thing I have to tell you is there are very, very few max grants. So people might have had, just let me give you an example, four feet of flooding. In that house with my private insurance policy, let's say that's 70000 of coverage. FEMA might then give them 10000 because FEMA's giving you money to make that house clean, safe, and sanitary so you can move back in. They're not giving you money to get it back in so you can muck and gut and get in blowers and dry that out. Even if you paid someone, there's 5000 And then you put up drywall, and then you cut out all the boards so it doesn't warp and fold, and you're living in a construction zone. That's how they're thinking, okay? Very few. Second, Max second Grant. Question. Next question. A person lives uh, on his boat. That's his home, and the boat is damaged. How, do, how would you, how does that work? <laughs> I've never I had know, a boat. I know but let me tell you that what I can tell you, I haven't had that. But I think he should be covered. Here's why I think he should be covered. I know because I do the National Disaster Legal Aid webpage, so I have to be, I was on the Hurricane Sandy calls, I'm on the Florida uh, Disaster Group Advisory Prep calls, and my finger's everywhere, and our flyers from Lone Star were sent to more Oklahoma to um, the Marshall Islands. Most recently, I sent them up to Michigan for their disaster. So I'm all over. So I know for a fact that if you lived in a tent, with the floods in Colorado, that was a home and you were covered. So therefore, based upon my prior experience and knowledge, I say a boat is covered. Apply. Next question. Is there any benefits? We were talking about the uh, the unemployment, uh, disaster unemployment assistance program. Is there any um, benefit to employees who only miss uh, a week of work um, or are still unable to go to work because of flooding? Tell them to apply. So the question is, is there any benefit for people that only missed a few days of work? The disaster unemployment benefits have been flowing. So tell them to apply. Let them be processed the days that they could not work through no fault of their own, and then they're back at work. So they could be evaluated for the time lost. So just tell them to apply. Always apply for everything. If you don't ask, you do not get, but I think that one should be good. Um, next question. Okay, I'm good here. So I'm just going to keep doing rows, if you'll forgive me, because I see so many hands, this is going to be really hard to handle otherwise. Apartment complexes that are flooded and yes, asking sir. the tenants to continue to pay rent. Uh, what's the response to that? And then how do we find out if they're a TAA member? 
Okay, you can contact the TAA. Or, okay, so the question is, what about the people in the apartment complex Thank you. that were flooded and the landlord is telling them continue to pay rent? So the question is, first question is a practical one. What do you want to do? Do you want to be released from this lease and move toward FEMA? How bad is the damage? Is the apartment uninhabitable? And this it, person wants to move out. It's okay, and they believe it's uninhabitable. So under that situation, then you ask to break the lease, and you call and say, hi, I'm the lawyer. This is uninhabitable. Please do this, or I'll have to consider legal action. We all know that story, right? Um, and then if the landlord wouldn't release them from the lease, then file action to have a judge determine that this is indeed uninhabitable. It's a mold hazard. It's a health hazard, whatever, that it violates the warranty of habitability. Technically, in Texas, that one doesn't run that way, you have to go to the property code about your duty for repairs. But if it's completely uninhabitable, you are entitled to be released from the lease, so you move forward that way. Feel free to call us if anybody's taking these cases pro bono. Um, I have a colleague who has a lot of appellate landlord-tenant cases for individual tenants. I don't think there's a lot of people that do that except the legal aids. So we have a wealth of knowledge to offer you. Okay, next question if you want to say... Your so and I'll repeat about, it. What What do you do about staying in a hotel while you are displaced from your home? Do they pay for a hotel? Or the evac like hotel list is open. If you're in an evac hotel, FEMA's paying that directly. Therefore, that money is not cash in hand to you. Therefore, it does not account against your 33300 FEMA total. So, But I understand the evac hotels are now full. But as people get their two months rent, and move on, then maybe there will be openings in the evac hotel. FEMA's got a number to call, and you could ask them questions like that. The clients can call and get further information. I can only speak to what I hear hearsay on that. But people are moving on. So that's about the evac hotel. What do you do if you're in a hotel? Um, what if you've already incurred that expense? If you've already incurred that expense. So what if you've already incurred the expense and you're in a hotel? So FEMA's going to give you an initial payment, one month for a homeowner, two months for a renter. So you'll be able to show them the receipts from the hotel. That satisfies the requirement of FEMA. And I still say you should get to what your long-term plan is. And for some people, it might be cleaning and drying out their house. It's not going to be repaired, but maybe it's better to go home. We've got children in schools. As long as, I mean, everyone's talking about the moisture tester, testing and mold testing. So if you can get in and the moisture's not too high and the mold's not too high and it's clean and dry and safe, even if it looks like a construction zone and you've just shoved drywall up, for some people that's the best answer. Everybody has to make the, it's your job to guide them based upon the law I'm teaching you as quickly as I can. <laughs> Next question. You probably won't be able to answer this, but to the extent that cities determine that certain areas should just be condemned, if we have families like in Beaumont who have water in their house for days and days, um, if they get money from FEMA, should they just hang on to that money until they know what's going to happen in that neighborhood? Okay. The question is, what about places? Beaumont apparently is discussing entire swaths of the city should be condemned and they're going to do eminent domain, I assume you're talking about. Um, also, there's a problem people are talking about buyouts. FEMA buyouts are like a two-year process to go under that, like the FEMA elevation grant. And just so you guys know, I'm sharing the knowledge I have with you, the elevation grant, this is like a national contest, and the city of Houston did it after 2015 and 16 floods. For the entire city, they're only doing 42 houses at a time. 42 houses for 2015 floods, 42 houses for 2016 floods. So I'm just holding that. So if people think they're getting bought out in two weeks, Based upon my prior knowledge, I think that's extremely unlikely. So let's go back to this. They should get out. They should get rental place. They should do what they can to use the FEMA money to rent. If FEMA gives them money for home repairs for their house, and that's what they've got, they should hold on to it to make a better decision. And also we advise everybody don't make any decision in haste. We don't know what's going on yet. They don't know. Rumors run rife. So we have to hold. I can't answer that completely because I haven't seen that. I haven't seen a bulletin from the city of Beaumont. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we're holding that. And um, there, this has been recorded, so there's some questions answered on the prior one. So I think that will help a lot of people. Um, so then let's – okay. Um, okay, let me preface this. 
with this is by Martin Mayo, who's board certified in litigation. Martin Mayo is an expert in flood insurance. He trained with me. He volunteered for Lone Star Legal Aid to be a volunteer pro bono attorney to pre-train at all three of the law schools in the city because we knew that we would like to have law student engagement so they can hand out information. And being law students, they're very interested in all this, and they wanted a lot of training for background even though they can't advise. So Martin very graciously created this for that purpose, and when I contacted him again and said, Martin, I've got a train. Are you coming with me? He's like, I can't do this. First of all, I'm out of the country, and after that, I have my own work to do, doing flood insurance claim work. And he said, you have my permission to use this. Tell everybody what I've taught you. And he, you'll notice he's updated this 9 to God love Martin Mayo. Um, this is an example of pro bono attorneys and the great help that they are. So Mar everything I know about flood insurance, I've been taught by Martin Mayo. Um, I've never handled a flood insurance claim myself. I've done flood insurance appeals for Lone Star clients to reopen, for example, personal property issues. But with regard to this and filing cases, I have not done it. This is the flood insurance. We talked about it. It's under the NFIP. Um, these are the coverages. If you're used to other insurance coverages, this is all going to look very familiar, except for the coverage D, increased cost of compliance. If they've decided that your house is 51% damaged, you will now fall under what is the National Flood Insurance Raise or Raise Rule. You must raise it, R-A-Z-E, to the ground, or you must raise it out of harm's way, R-A-I-S-C. And your house now in the city of Houston, for example, because that's what we're all most familiar with, has to be one foot above the base flood elevation. Other jurisdictions make a two-foot rule, for example. Um, but that will help you. But it only goes up the $250,000. So I live in Meyerland. I'm ground zero for flooding in the city. So I've got lots of experience with this. People were very upset. They got 250000 for their structure. And they said, no, I'm declared substantially damaged. I want my other money. And they said, part D. And they said, I'm so sorry. That's only up to 250 total. So that's an important thing. What's the covered risk? It's a single risk policy. So I think everybody understands that. Uh, how to file a claim. Everybody's already passed this point. Everything's always take a lot of pictures, document, document, document. You've got to get your proof of loss in it by the deadline. Here's the deal about the proof of loss. This is where tips from Martin Mayo about flood insurance is so important. Um, the insurance adjuster does it for you as a courtesy. It is your duty to do the actual proof of loss. This is a very special proof of loss. This is the NFIP flood proof of loss. There's a document. It's out of date. They've already issued a rule that you're still allowed to use it. The OMB hasn't updated it yet. Normally, it's 60 days. It's already been extended to a year. It's a very specific. It's very hard for people to do the proof of loss if they're not one of the adjusters, the public adjusters, or an adjuster that's very experienced in it. It's not like the other proof of loss. That's the first caveat. Um, sworn to documentation submitted at the right time. This is what a FEMA NFIP proof of loss, and as I said, you'll notice that one should have expired in April. I checked it the day the flood hit. It expired in April. There's continuing guidance that it's allowed to be used even though it's expired. Um, and oh, Martin, um, you know, he updated all this. Um, how it should be adjusted. What I used to tell people is best advice I can give you is if you've got your contractor and you know he's going to do your repairs, you get him there when the NFIP adjuster comes, you have him walk the property with you. The flood insurance adjuster is going to tell you, I get paid more money by how high I write your claim. So you think that's great. He's going to write my claim high. Technically, that's true. But technically, what he's not telling you is they're audited on a regular basis. If he pays you anything over that, he has to pay back everything to them. So they have a huge incentive to underwrite your claim. But isn't it interesting that they tell you that they get paid more for each part of the claim, the higher claim they write, and they don't tell you the second part. Um, so it's not possible to get your contractors to walk these NFIP adjusters at this point. It's just not. So what you're going to have to do is get your own contractor or public adjuster as fast as you humanly can and get him. Do not wait on them to do your proof of loss to contradict it. You start feeding your information to that flood adjuster that FEMA's hired now because 
it's always easier to adjust it before it's written than after. Because if you can show a hundred things he left off, he's got to answer to his supervisor about why he left those off. It's always easier to adjust it on the front end than after the fact. But you can still, it's a negotiation, and I think I'm talking to a room of a lot of people that are aware of how this works. So you know what to do with this, but don't let your clients wait. You start now. Um, for my clients, they can't afford a public adjuster. Um, they just can't. So even uh, we do have some clients that have flood insurance, and that's the practical versus legal, and it's just sad. Um, everything in writing, document everything, everything right now. For example, right now they're telling people to get absolutely everything out of their houses, and I'm saying we'll get them to put it in writing because if you look at what they have in writing, some things come out and some things they want kept on the premises. So just if they tell you something, get them to put it in writing. So if you don't like the, what you see from the adjuster, you get your own adjuster and you've got warning proofs of loss. You have to get yours submitted by the deadline. What's really unusual, if you haven't been able to submit your own proof of loss by the deadline, and you haven't been able to adjust him or negotiate to a better one, you just make sure you get your own proof of loss filed by the deadline. Um, but there's something really weird about flood insurance. If they prepare a proof of loss, let's say you think your damages are 250 and he gives you one that says 150 you can accept his proof of loss. You sign it, say, accept it as uncontroverted amount only. I will be supplementing and filing my own proof of loss by the deadline doesn't do you any good if you miss that deadline. You're shut out and closed out. They'll pay you within the 60 days based upon their adjuster's money, so at least you've got your money to start your repairs or whatever you need to do while you fight with them over it. They'll give you the money after 60 days of the proof of loss. You have to file the lawsuit within one year of the date of the written denial of any part or all of your claim. In other words, the proof of loss that they give you. Because if you think it's 250 and they give you a proof of loss that says 150, that's a denial of part of what you believe your claim is then your clock starts ticking. You have to go into the federal court. If Allstate is the write-your-own program you're dealing with, you sue Allstate. They've, I've seen cases thrown out because they were filed in the state of Texas. They seem to forget that these are NFIP federal claims. And I've also seen them name FEMA, and the case gets thrown out because they should have named Allstate. Okay, so I think I've already talked about this. Oh, also, the, another little, um, and I want to say trick, I want to say thing I have observed is that they say, okay, here, just sign the proof of loss, and then we'll do supplemental claims. They can do supplemental claims. You're at their mercy, not controlling it, because they can do supplemental claims within six months of the proof of loss. So if you, they gave you 5000 for your cabinets and it was 8000 then you get your receipts and submit it, and they consider that a supplemental and then it's up to them if they want that to be considered reasonable or not. You're in a much better position if you've submitted your own proof of loss by that deadline because that's your working document, not being at their mercy. So I have clients that I'm advising that we haven't, it doesn't reach that, and I'm like, sure, you can do a supplemental claim, but now you're at their mercy instead of you controlling. So get your own proof of loss in. Um, you can appeal the claim. So FEMA's going to deny it. You submit your proof of loss. You appeal it. And then you can discuss it with them. They might change it. You might be able to reach a negotiation. But if you do not get your proof of loss filed by the proof of loss deadline, which right now is one year from the date of loss, you do not have the ability to file the federal lawsuit under that document. Um, it's not a valued policy, so you can't just say, look at this, I get my 250000 They say, yeah, you were insured up to two fifty, but your house is only worth a hundred. So we'll do repair costs up to the total cost of your house. That's why you see that there's an appraisal fight that comes often with these cases. State Bar of Texas had a webinar on flood insurance on September 5th. That's online. One of my friends saw it and said, people were asking FEMA questions. This was primarily about flood insurance appraisal fights. So I refer you to that for further information. Um, substantially damaged, I've already talked about that. Um, you need to get the mold out. This is a reason. They're not going to pay you for mold going all the way up to the walls if you could have come in and cut it out three feet out and then saved the rest of your house. So they won't cover for that because you didn't mitigate the circumstances. 
Uh, no interest or attorney's fees under the NFIP. The problem for our clients and other people is that the private bar, like for example, last year I was told all the time, they wanted the gap between what you thought it should be and what FEMA thought it should be to be 100000 or more for the private flood insurance attorneys to step in. That doesn't help all the people that have small flood insurance complaints. Private bar can step up and do these on a pro bono basis. Hopefully you're all going to become flood insurance experts and volunteer to help on a pro bono basis. Flood policy paid for, okay, we talked about that, and I'm done. And I double-checked this with Martin Mayo. I mean, literally this phone call was, Martin, do I have permit? It's like, Martin, can you come with me? I'm going out of the country, and then I'm working my own. Martin, is it still true that you can sign it, accept it as, as uncontested amounts only? Yes, it's true. Tell everyone. And that's all I have on that. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we'll do a few in-room questions while I get some of our webinar questions, of which we have to fill the rest of our time taken care of. So here on the third row. Can you speak to the any problems of the, I mean, special problems of the undocumented flood victim? Um, the undocumented flood victim is eligible for disaster legal services. So you as the private bar can help them. If they get them to the, do an intake, get it to us. Do the 1-800-504-7030 State Bar Texas Disaster Line. They can come to us, and then we refer them out to the private bar. HVL is accepting the over-income, over-asset, undocumented cases. With regard to, for example, an undocumented family that has citizen children, which is very normal here, they'll do their FEMA application in the name of any citizen or green card resident person, and then, for example, if it's a mom and dad with two citizen children, this is the easiest example to use, and it's oh so common, the application will usually go in the name of the oldest child. They'll list both children and their socials. They list the parents, no social. FEMA knows then that they are not docked, and then they'll give a 50% rental stipend. So if the rental stipend's 500 a month, they'll give them 250 a month. So at least they're getting some help. Please encourage them to apply. There's that this information is not being shared with other departments. There's been a lot of fear and a lot of rumors. So the answer is please encourage them to apply, and there can be some help. Disaster Legal Services is not dependent upon the income asset eligibility, so that means the private bar has to serve that need. So we're, we're, you're stepping up beautifully, and we hope you'll remember this process. The legal needs are going to go on for a long time. It's just the legal issues are going to change over time. Okay, so our first question from the web is about the uh, reservoir releases. What we'll do is we'll do web in person, web in person. So that's how we'll do for the, until we get to our time. The releases are man-made, although they are related to Harvey. Will flood insurance coverage be extended to include those homes flooded by the dam releases? I understand that they do. Okay, that's a yes. Right in the back. There are a lot of small uh, social groups as well as large churches that are providing relief efforts uh, where you send out teams to do cleanup. Is there a flyer that you can point us to to recommend that uh, these groups provide to homeowners? Is there a particular flyer that... For Lone Star Legal Aid, um, we can disseminate that virtually to the members of HBA to get out the word about the 1-800-504-7030. And also, one point about that, um, I was the chair last year, Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. Every nonprofit that responded to disasters, we're all very interconnected and know each other. The catchphrase is, you don't want to exchange business cards in the middle of a disaster. There's an organization called Crisis Cleanup that um, there's been talk about people that have done virtual things to find these houses. All those people that were in the news have now been dumped into crisis cleanup. That's a national nonprofit. If you please Google crisiscleanup.org, it's been in um, force since before Sandy. He created it in New Jersey the year before. That means the people responding to those houses are going to be Texas Baptist men, the Mennonites, the LDS. The people who traditionally do that. So, and we're also asking, this is VOAD, not legal, I'm so sorry, but we're trying to get all the unaffiliated volunteers affiliated with church groups, the nonprofits, to, to make sure they're getting the, the proper training to do the things they're doing. So push the crisis cleanup, and just to let you know of the bona fides of it, when you called 311 to report your house flooded, the city of Houston 
then reported that documentation to crisis cleanup. That's how vetted this process. So that's a safe vetting. One thing I'll mention also, if you are a member of a church or a nonprofit organization who is interested in hosting something for your members or for your community, um, Houston Volunteer Lawyers, I know, is working on getting those set up. If, if your site is not one that normally has legal clinics, email Jessie Campbell at Houston Volunteer Lawyers, and she's helping coordinate with her team on who's going to, if there is a need there, and then how quickly they could get someone staffed there. Any clinics, legal clinics that are set up through Houston Volunteer Lawyers should also be included on the HVL portal, the one that Alistair mentioned at the top of the hour. That's the one you're logging into to volunteer at the shelters. It'll be the one you're logging into to volunteer at the clinics. Do you know where the Lone Star Legal Aid is? Um, do you want people contacting you about that as well, or do you want that routed through HVL? Right now we're routing the pro bono volunteers to HVL's portal okay. due to the recent... Okay, because you had a fire in your office. Yes, mm -hmm. understood. Okay, question from the web. If a property is considered substantially damaged such that repair costs exceed 50% of the value of the structure, what will flood insurance cover with respect to the structure? The flood insurance is going to cover the repairs to the structure the way it normally would, but you have to decide which option you're taking. You might want to tear your house down and build a new one, then you'd use the monies for that. You might want to use the insurance monies to pay for the actual elevation of your house, for example. But you're entitled to be paid for your coverage for the repair of the property just like you would under any other insurance policy, and then you get to make your best decision about what you do with those monies. So push for your best, highest flood insurance settlement. Okay, over here. Um, for um, people who are living in their parents' home and, you know, they're not paying rent or anything, um, in Bayonne County, they're going to have to pay for the Okay, let me, let me address that in a different way, something that hasn't come up. If you were living in your parents' house prior to the disaster, you're considered one household, even though you're an adult and might be filing your own separate tax return. Oh, now I understand. You would be considered and treated as a renter. You're just someone not paying rent at that. You're living there. So your parents' house will not be covered under FEMA because that has to be your primary residence. You had to have been living there at the time of the disaster event. So the, 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 the adult child living there would then be able to say, this is where I was living, this is the damaged property. They're going to access it and say, yes, indeed, it's substantially damaged, and they're going to send them to the evac hotel or start the rental assistance process because they need to go somewhere else. So I'm assuming that the parents are going to file their flood insurance claim, assuming they have one, if they don't have one, which brings me to a potential fraud issue. Um, we've already had people reporting that their landlords are insisting that they give them their tenant's social security number. It's only speculation on my part, but that property is not going to be repaired as a landlord's rental property, but if the landlord hypothetically should claim that that's his primary residence, then he would get FEMA repair money. Are you following me? Which comes back to, I, we keep saying, if they didn't need your information before the flood, they don't need it now. Okay, let me ask one quick one from here. Are people successful in getting rental assistance from FEMA after the initial two months following denial of assistance from the flood policy? The flood policy means probably that you're the homeowner, so you're only getting one month's rent under that circumstance. Then you're referred to the SBA, and you're expected to take out a loan for additional living expenses. And yes, I know the reality is people are going to rent a house and continue to pay their mortgage. We're aware of that. But if you have the financial means, you're being referred to the SBA for that. Okay, and someone, there, there you go, right there. Just a point of clarification on the, so let's say FEMA approved $50,000 for home repairs. And you had said that you need to make a decision about whether or not you're going to use that money indeed for the repairs, or let's say if your home is substantially damaged whether you're going to use that for, let's say, um, a new home. I'm talking about flood insurance. FEMA doesn't give anybody more than 33300 It's only the flood insurance monies 
that if you have a flood insurance policy, you're entitled to the complete and total repair cost to put your house back to the way it was prior to the flood. So at that point, let's say you get the whole 250, then you're substantially damaged, obviously, because, you know, it's the 250, it's the full amount. So you either, you can't repair your house now by law. You cannot get building permits. You are not permitted until you lift it up. So you could use that money to lift it up. And that's also a good reason to go to the SBA because the lift in my neighborhood privately is about 150. I'm just being ballpark, everybody. So you'd use the 150 of the 250 for your lift and now you've got 100 for your home repair, but your home repair is 250. So you've got a need of 150. The only place you can address that is, let's call it the upper middle class family, is to apply to the SBA. Okay, and here's a question. It relates to the recent extension to 365 days. Um, so the, here's the question, and you can clarify it. I understand that FEMA extended the time for filing proof of loss from 60 days to one year for Hurricane Harvey applicants from Harris County. Is that not the case? The proof of loss is extended for everybody under Harvey for one year from the actual date of loss. But what that doesn't extend, because it's statutory, is the one year you have to file lawsuit against your policy carrier. Pretend it's all state with me because it's just easy for me today. <laughs> um, I'm just picking on them. Um, so you might not even submit your proof of loss for a year. But they might have given you their proof of loss at the six-month point. That means you have one year from their proof of loss, even though you still got six months. So that might mean you're filing a proof of loss at the one-year point, but you've only got six more months to get ready for your lawsuit. It really got absurd and sandy because their proof of loss deadline was extended past the one-year lawsuit deadline, and a lot of lawyers got caught in that. They cannot change the one year to file suit. In the back row. So if, if I've got a client that has, lives in a, let's say, $150,000 house and it's had, you know, six feet of sewage water in it for a couple of weeks and he doesn't have flood insurance, the most he can get from FEMA is 33300 And very few people get that max grant. Very few people. The question for the people listening via webinar was, house was completely destroyed, underwater for five weeks, no flood insurance. Is 33300 the most he can actually get? And the answer is yes. There's no exception or exclusion to the 33,300. Um, and, you know, people are talking. We've had wind events in conjunction with that. If the wind pulled the roof off and rain came into your second floor, obviously there's homeowners issues too. But, so, but no matter what your insurance coverage is, if your need is greater than your insurance coverage or lack of insurance coverage, the maximum amount, the only amount you can get is 33,000. 300, and very, very few people get that max grant. Okay. Is it possible to be paid for repairs under your flood policy and also be paid under coverage D for relocation, elevation, or demolition? Um, yes, as long as you don't go over your 250000 max for your property. But your Part D, here's another thing. People are running around going, I want to be substantially damaged. I want my Part D money. It's like think long or hard about that because, you know, once you – get that letter from the floodplain management in the city, you don't get to go back on it. And if you got the rolling and you don't believe it's right, you can contest it. Because if they use, for example, the HCAD values, that's not the actual value of your structure, correct? So that's where lawyers come in. Yep. Right here. My client um, inherited her house from her father and they never probated the well. Her son and his family are living in there and paying her rent. And they flooded, and she does not have flood insurance. Is she only eligible for an SBA loan in that circumstance? Under the circumstances you mentioned. Pardon? She pays taxes. So the question is: uh, the the mother of the family living in the house inherited it through a probate that wasn't completed, whether it's through a will or through intestacy. She's the actual. Owner. Under the state's code, it happens automatically, magically. The ancestor dies, whether it's in testacy or with the will. Now the daughter owns it. Pretend she's the only child. She's now allowed her son and his family to live there. And are they paying rent or not paying rent? So they're paying rent, so they're renters. 
So they're going to get FEMA coverage for their personal property and rental assistance to move forward up to that 33000 max. She will not be covered under FEMA in any way because it is not her primary residence. But she is the owner, so then she should apply for an SBA disaster loan, not for her personal. You know, they're going to ask her all that, but she should apply for an SBA disaster loan. This is rental property. All rental property should get back online as quickly as possible. Okay, uh, two two questions from the web that, that I can answer very quickly, and then we'll get back into here. One of them was the phone number for the State Bar of Texas hotline. It's 800-504-7030. And then the other one that was related to that is, if we can't offer legal advice, where do you refer someone for help filing claims and appeals, navigating deadlines, et cetera? I would say call Legal Line, which is going on three to five every weekday this month, this month of September, you can call Legal Line, which is sponsored by the HBA, from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. The phone number is 713-759-1133. They will either answer your question or refer you to an organization that may be able to help. The other thing to do is contact HVL directly about potential intake, or contact Lone Star Legal Aid. Are you guys open for intake right now or still it's, recovering? It's going to the hotline. The intakes okay. are being handled there. Okay right now. And we're taking them in the field. Also, anybody sees rental issues, especially with notices to vacate, especially with the closing of entire apartment complexes, allegedly, for rehab, they're being shut. We'd like to see those, the closing of entire complexes, or any notices to vacate that you consider um, that are deficient under the property code. Okay, and the question on the first row? Oh, I just wanted to follow up on that um, question that was asked about letting go of the there. She said that she paid rent. What if she didn't pay rent? That's the same scenario. Um, so it's the same scenario as prior with the parent that wasn't probated and the person is living there. Um, Okay. So the question now is, what if they weren't paying rent? Okay. If you're a household together before the storm, you're expected to be a household together after the storm. One person will be designated head of household, generally the person that's actually on the lease. If you were a sub renter and you paid them rent, you can apply to FEMA, show them that you were paying them rent. There's a slightly different process for roommates, and I'm sorry, and you'll have to forgive me, I can't memorize everything. It is addressed in the unified, um, it's addressed in the September 2016 unified guidance on the individual and households program. I actually saw it yesterday. So there is a special provision for that and I just have to refer you to it. I'm sorry, I try. Okay, so two related questions from the web is FEMA income based is the first question and the second one that is, relates to it is, if someone receives money from FEMA and they use it for exactly what FEMA asks them or tells them to use it for, are they at any risk of owing that money back under any circumstance? <laughs> Legal and practical answer. Okay, the first one is FEMA income based. The answer is no, except for the items listed on the right-hand slide under the ONA, things like personal property and the continued rental assistance. So it's not income-based. That's what I said. Millionaires were getting their one-month rent to just regroup and figure out what they were doing. Um, but as a practical matter, you're expected to um, go to the SBA and, if you can, pay for the personal property and for the rental. So that was a yes and no answer. And the second question, can you repeat it, please? I want to make sure. Sure. The second question is, is there any danger that if FEMA gives me money and I spend it on exactly what they tell me to spend it on, is, is there danger FEMA will come back and say, you've got to give some of that back to us? Okay. The answer should be no. The answer in reality is sometimes it's yes because I dealt with the recoupments under Hurricane Katrina. And um, people weren't getting notices. Um, it was uh, another thing. It, make sure you update FEMA with your address that you can prove it that you update them. I would tell you to update them with your address every three months. We were successful with wrongful recruitments when the clients actually knew it was happening, and uh, a lot of the reasons they weren't getting the notices is FEMA had been updated with the client's address and continued to send them to the first address. So the, those were good cases. FEMA recruitments will become a problem down the line. They shouldn't be, but based upon my past experience, I have to tell you I anticipate that they will be. So the answer is, by law, it shouldn't be, but as a practical matter, it could be, and they'll need to be addressed on a case-by-case -case matter. 
I have one more kind of from the web very quickly, and that might be the last one we have time for, except for the person on the second row who did raise her hand. So uh, just from the web, can you briefly, you talked about buyouts. Uh, briefly, again, what's the likelihood of buyouts? We don't know what it is. We know there's a lot of talk and rumor. We know that there is FEMA gives grants for what are called FEMA elevation grants, FEMA mitigation grants. FEMA has two grant programs. They're a long, drawn-out process. They take a year and a half to two years to get online, and you have to continue to carry your flood insurance to, for example, get a FEMA elevation grant. And I've heard a lot of people talking about, I just want to save money and drop my flood insurance now. Well, um, I know for sure you must have the FEMA flood insurance to continue to be eligible for the elevation grant. I haven't had a chance to see if that's also true for the buyout, but I would suspect it is due to the fact that it comes from FEMA. And I do apologize. I have worked every day since the flood. I'm moving as fast as I humanly can. So I just can't answer that. But the buyout process will be long and drawn out, and people need to understand that the 2015 and 16 only did 40 houses, 42 houses in the entire city of Houston under those grants. Unless they're going to use a different process and a different pot of money, and I can't speak to something that's not online yet. Yep. Okay, last question. Can you speak anything to farmers that have lost all their right. in the, you know, the river? Absolutely. If you go to the USDA page, if you go um, to my national disasterlegalaid.org webpage that I do, I try the very best to keep it up. I'm the content coordinator. Um, so there is a whole provision about, for people who need help, what you can do to me. I'm a visual person, so as you go on that web page, the left-hand portal is for people who need help. The middle portal is all the law you need. You can access the CFR while you're out at a disaster recovery. I put everything on the FEMA page. The right hand is for pro bonos that want to volunteer. If you go to my left-hand column and go down, you click the first page, and it says, um, what help is available? The USDA is about in the middle of that list. When you click that, it's going to talk about the different disaster programs for the USDA. And people have crop insurance. People have livestock insurance. But what comes online in a disaster? It will tell you about it, and then you're just going to need to go to the USDA. I'm sorry. I'm in Houston, so I wasn't prepped for that. If I was giving a talk in Bryan, I would have prepped a little differently. Um, so, yes, there's things that are online. Please look. And my website, just go straight to the USDA, but if you want to see what we're doing, what I've been doing since 2012, go to the disasterlegalaid.org webpage. It's not perfect, but it's as good as I can keep making it while I do my other full-time job. Thank you. Okay, so there were a, a good number of questions that we got online that we didn't have a chance to address. We have those here. They're being preserved. And someone from Lone Star Legal Aid has already said they'll make an attempt to answer any of the unanswered ones that weren't here. This webinar will be made available on demand. So if you have colleagues who could benefit from this, they can listen to it on demand for their 1.5 hours of CLE credit as well. It will be available for at least a year afterward. Um, I want to thank Sandra and Amanda, Lone Star Legal Aid, for getting out here to do a training in the middle of everything that they're dealing with. Thank you. And also thank the Houston Bar Association and Houston Volunteer Lawyers for helping round up everyone and publicize this event so we could have a good turnout. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you very much.